and recognizing the South as an independent nation. This is the original magazine article from Scribner's in 1930. But Churchill's not finished with the story. Facing the rise of Germany in the early 20th century, President Theodore Roosevelt and British Prime Minister Arthur Balfour meet to consider an alliance. And when the president of the Confederate States, a Virginian named Woodrow Wilson, joins in, the three nations sign the, quote, Covenant of the English-Speaking Association, which adopts international peace and disarmament as its foreign policy. In 1914, when continental Europe begins to mobilize, the English speakers threaten war and the potential belligerents stand down. Thus, in Churchill's words, quote, World War I, which might well have led to the loss of many millions of lives, never came to pass. All because Jeb Stewart arrived in the nick of time and Robert E. Lee did win the Battle of Gettysburg. That's a great story, even if none of it ever happened. In Europe in the 1930s, the rise of fascism and the darkening clouds of war kept Churchill increasingly busy, his voice a clarion call against appeasement. So you might think that a couple of articles were as much as he could devote to the Civil War. But Churchill soon found a greater use for what he had learned. In 1932, he signed a contract to write a major work of popular history, which would become four volumes entitled a History of the English-Speaking Peoples. It began with Julius Caesar's arrival in Britain and went all the way to the dawn of the 20th century. Wanting to appeal to the much larger American audience, Churchill knew that the story of the United States, and in particular its Civil War, should be a significant part of the work. Over the next few years, he wrote much of the four volumes, but then set them aside in September 1939. The Second World War interrupted, and for the next six years, he was busy indeed. The History of the English-Speaking Peoples was finally published between 1956 and 1958, totaling over 500,000 words, and immediately became an international bestseller. Academics did not consider it innovative or groundbreaking. For example, it paid little or no attention to economic and social history. But it was and is a beautifully written, fluid and expressive narrative of political and military history, and is perhaps the best read and most loved of Churchill's works. In its review, the New York Times noted, quote, the unequaled zeal of Churchill's style, adding, he has the visual imagination to actually see the events he describes. More importantly, the work skillfully presents the case for the historic special relationship between Britain and America, a phrase which he, Churchill used in his iconic speech in Fulton, Missouri, 50 years ago this past March. For Churchill, the special relationship was not just a military or political fact, but was grounded in shared values. It stood as a bulwark of democracy for the world. It's not surprising that these volumes have gone through multiple editions and are still in print today. The fourth and final volume of the history is titled <coughs> The Great Democracies and begins with the downfall of Napoleon in 1815. It ends with the Boer War, which shattered many of the illusions about British imperial superiority and foreshadowed the wars of the 20th century, which would erode and ultimately end Britain's status as a great world power. The most important section of the book is the middle third, most of which is about the Civil War. By the summer of 1939, Churchill had finished a detailed military narrative of the war, aided by a distinguished British historian, Sir James Edmonds, who had written his own full-length study of it. Writing to Edmonds, Churchill summarized his overall view of the conflict. Quote, the Confederates never had any chance at all. It was only a question of the North getting underway and the amount of time to destroy, if necessary, every living soul in the Confederate States. But how dramatic was the wonderful resistance they made. Interest in Churchill's account of the Civil War was so high that just three years after it was first published in 1958, it came out as a separate volume entitled The American Civil War, which has been frequently reprinted. I hope you'll be intrigued enough to get a copy of that book 
so I won't attempt to summarize Churchill's entire narrative of the war. But here are some highlights. Not surprisingly, Churchill's view of the war reflected the historiography of the day in which the South's lost cause stood as a noble, if failed, effort. He sees the origins of the war in slavery, but also in other differences pitting North against South. Churchill's sympathy for Virginia and its admiration for its greatest son, Robert E. Lee, both as a man and a military leader, is clear. He describes Lee this way, one of the noblest Americans who has ever lived and one of the greatest captains known to the annals of war. Churchill had similar admiration for Stonewall Jackson and considered Jackson's partnership with Lee as the high point of the conflict. But Churchill goes on to note that by the end of 1863, the South knew that the war was lost, but that, quote, it is one of the enduring glories of the American nation that this made no difference to Southern resistance. Churchill also acknowledged the accomplishments of Grant and Sherman, albeit in less lofty terms. He writes about the war of attrition waged against the Confederate armies and the Union's determination to break the economic infrastructure and morale of the entire South. Leaping a half century forward, he recognizes in these elements tactics employed by the Allies in the even greater struggle of the First World War. Not surprisingly, for a man who loved freedom, Churchill's hostility to slavery appears in a number of places in the book. He describes the abolition of the slave trade in the empire in 1807 as one of Britain's greatest achievements and favorably notes the searing indictment of slavery in Harry Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. On another occasion, he wrote, of all the wars that men have fought, none was more noble than the Civil War in America. But all the heroism of the South could not redeem their cause from the stain of slavery. But that said, Churchill, reflecting the thinking of his time, criticized Reconstruction as, quote, a shameful and discreditable episode. Historians today, of course, have a much different and much more nuanced view of that complex time. You're probably wondering what about Lincoln? <clears throat> Unlike modern accounts of the Civil War, Lincoln does not dominate Churchill's narrative. But Churchill recognizes the president's stature while recording some of his flaws as a military commander in chief. He speaks of Lincoln's, quote, natural resolution and generosity of character. Churchill goes on to say, Lincoln's homely humor stood him in good stead. A sense of irony helped to lighten his burdens. His spirit was sustained by a deep belief in providence. Churchill added, at the summit of authority, it is sometimes necessary to bear the intrigues of disloyal colleagues, to remain calm when others panic, and to withstand misguided popular outcries. All this Lincoln did. That could, in fact, be Churchill speaking of himself during the darkest days of the Second World War. Churchill ends his narrative with Appomattox and Lincoln's assassination. Of Lincoln's death, he says, with him vanished the only protector of the prostrate self. None but he could control the bitter political hatreds. The assassin's bullet had wrought more evil to the United States than all the Confederate cannon. If you're interested in reading more about Lincoln and Churchill, there's a wonderful website by Lou Lerman entitled lincolnandchurchill.com. The parallels between Lincoln and Churchill's wartime experiences and the challenges they faced are striking. How to maintain and build a successful coalition government. How to deal with military commanders not enthusiastic about fighting. <clears throat> How to powerfully communicate to a broad public both in writing and in inspiring speeches, and how to defeat dangerous ideologies that crush liberty and human freedom. Lou summarizes the Lincoln and Churchill dichotomy this way. Theirs are the stories we tell of great leaders. Let them inspire a world still in need of extraordinary leadership. Lou calls Lincoln and Churchill the two greatest statesmen in English-speaking history, one of the 19th and the other of the 20th century. 
I say amen to that and can only add, there doesn't seem to be another Lincoln in America today, nor a Churchill in Britain. <laughs> Churchill finishes account of the war with this beautiful epitaph. Thus ended the great American Civil War, the noblest and least avoidable of all the great conflicts of which there was a record. The genius of America was impoverished by the alienation of many elements in the life of the Republic. But after the smoke of the battlefield had cleared, the horrid shape, Churchill means slavery, which had cast its shadow over the whole continent, had vanished and was gone forever. As the Second World War approached, Churchill reflected on what he had learned from Civil War history. Many in Germany and Japan believed America weak and unwilling to step into a new war and fight. Churchill thought otherwise, reflecting, some said Americans were soft, they would never stand bloodletting. But I had studied the Civil War, fought to the last desperate inch. And as the Second World War progressed, Churchill saw in his American allies echoes of the commanders of the last century, saying, there was about General Robert E. Lee a quality of selflessness which raised him to the very highest rank of men. And in General Marshall and General Eisenhower, that character, that quality of selflessness, has been a bond uniting the Allied armies. That comment was especially appropriate as one of Marshall's family had been an aide to Lee during the Civil War. To Marshall as to Churchill, both Lee and Jackson were heroic figures. And Eisenhower, too, while not a Southerner, had a keen interest in Civil War generals and their campaigns. Later, retiring to his farm in Gettysburg, he too speculated on what might have happened if that battle had ended differently. <laughs> and in 1959, Churchill made his last visit to the United States, which included a three-day stay in the White House. Eisenhower arranged a helicopter flight to Pennsylvania, where they shared the bird's eye view of the battlefield and then drove around in a golf cart. <laughs> the end of the Civil War provided Churchill with a classic example of one of his favorite themes, the need for reconciliation in the wake of conflict. <clears throat> After the First World War, he noted that it was rare for a victor to secure by generosity what had been gained by force. In his words, quote, those who can make the victory cannot make the peace. Those who make the peace would never have won the victory. Churchill described Grant's magnanimous conduct at Appomattox as the greatest day of his career and a high point in American history. And he saluted Lincoln's desire for reconciliation with the vanquished. When the Third Reich capitulated at the end of the Second World War, Churchill said of the German people, my hate died with their surrender, and I was much moved by their haggard looks and threadbare clothes. Eighty years before, on April 4, 1865, Abraham Lincoln had come to the capital of the Confederacy in Richmond just, at, just after its evacuation by Confederate forces. It was reported that the president encountered a crowd of slaves exulting in their new freedom and in the arrival of their near mythical redeemer. One very old man threw himself on his knees in front of the president. Lincoln looked down and said, you must kneel to God only and thank him for the liberty which you will hereafter enjoy. As long as I live, you shall have the rights which God has given to every citizen of the Republic. Lincoln also received a delegation of white Virginians anxious to know what fate awaited their state. <coughs> they must, he said, quote, not love Virginia less, but must love the Republic more. When Churchill wrote his memoirs of the Second World War, each volume began with what he called the moral of the work. It is, in war, resolution, in defeat, defiance, in victory, magnanimity, in peace, goodwill. Both Abraham Lincoln and Robert E. Lee would certainly have thought such words well chosen. Churchill put his knowledge of the Civil War to good use on other unexpected occasions. In May 1943, he visited Roosevelt in the White House, and the president decided to entertain his guests with a road trip to the, to the Catoctin Mountains of Maryland, 
to a presidential retreat he called Shangri-La. Today, thanks to President Eisenhower, who named it after his grandson, it's Camp David. This is Churchill and Roosevelt fishing that trip to visit to Camp David, cigar in hand. Um, off they all went in one car, the President and First Lady, Churchill, and the President's aide, Harry Hopkins. When they passed through the town of Frederick, Maryland, Churchill asked, isn't this where Barbara Fritchie lived, the woman in the famous Civil War poem by John Greenleaf Whittier? Pleased with his guest's interest, the president said yes and began to recite the poem. Up from the meadows rich with corn, clear in the cool September morn. But then there was an awkward silence. FDR had forgotten the rest of the words. <laughs> Well, Winston Churchill, among his many other attributes, had a near photographic memory. As a teenager at his boarding school, Harrow, he once won a prize for declaiming without notes a now forgotten poem entitled, The Lays of Ancient Rome, all 1,200 lines of it. <laughs> so much to his host's surprise, he proceeded to recite the 30 couplets of Barbara Fritchie by heart. I suspect the Roosevelt's were quite impressed. <laughs> It turns out that there's more to the story of Barbara Fitchie, with a picture of her, and this poem than I thought. If we can digress a minute, I think it's worth explaining, since it says something about fact, fiction, and memory in history, and how they sometimes can get mixed up. The poem, and this is a contemporary rendering of the story, purports to tell the story of an incident in the town of Frederick, Maryland, a few miles north of Washington, in September 1862. By that time, the war was some 18 months old, and nothing had gone as planned for either side. The North had expected a conflict of just a few months, but that illusion was shattered with the early Confederate victory at the Battle of Bull Run. The South, for its part, expected the Yankees, even with their superior numbers and industrial might, to quickly lose patience with the grinding conflict, especially when faced with the supposedly superior Confederate fighting spirit. That too was an illusion shattered by a series of back and forth battles in Virginia and the success of Union commanders in the Western theater. To break the deadlock, Robert E. Lee decided to invade Maryland at the beginning of uh, September. Maryland, while a slave state, had remained in the Union. Lee hoped that a successful campaign on Northern territory would convince European governments to recognize the South's independence. He also hoped to deal a severe blow to Northern morale by defeating the Army of the Potomac on its own soil. It was in that context that General Stonewall Jackson and his forces marched into Frederick the morning of September 6th. Jackson was perhaps the most renowned of Confederate officers apart from Lee himself. Whittier's poem has Jackson riding to Frederick with his men. The rebels see 40 Union flags flying and tear them all down one by one. But a local woman named Barbara Fritchie, Whittier puts her age at four score years and 10, raises the last one back up in her attic window. Jackson sees it and cries halt and then fire. And a blast of rifles tears up the window and rips holes in the flag. It begins to fall to the ground, but Barbara Fritchie scoops it up, waves it high, and cries out the famous lines, shoot if you must this old gray head, but spare your country's flag, she said. Struck by this act of defiance, Whittier says of Jackson, quote, the nobler nature within him stirred, and quotes his words to his men, who touches a hair of yon gray head, look, dies like a dog, march on. Mm. And Whittier continues, all day long that free flag toast over the head of the rebel host. Whittier concludes the poem with these stirring lines. Barbara Fitchie's work is o'er, and the rebel rides on his raids no more. Over Barbara Fitchie's grave, flag of freedom and union wave. Peace and order and beauty draw round thy symbol of light and law. And ever the stars above look down on thy stars below in Fredericktown. You can't get more melodramatic than that, and it's no wonder that the poem, 
after being published in the Atlantic Magazine in October of the following year, became one of the most popular and inspiring works of the Civil War, one that was taught to generations of school children, at least in most of the United States. Its canonical fame obviously left the Atlantic, and Churchill must have read and memorized it early in his own education. The poem was of particular importance to Whittier because he was not only a poet, but since his youth in the 1830s, had been an ardent abolitionist and anti-slavery journalist. But he was also a Quaker, and being a pacifist, found it hard to write poetry during a terrible, bloody conflict that was patriotic but nonviolent. No wonder that when he heard the story of Barbara Fritchie, he quickly set it to verse as a perfect example of the power of what was later called passive resistance. Well, all that makes for a wonderful story with just one exception, it isn't quite true. <laughs> By the time Whittier's poem appeared in October 1863, Lee's first invasion of the North had failed at the bloodiest single battle in American history at Antietam, Maryland, barely a week after Jackson's ride into Frederick. The second and much more dramatic attempt was turned back at Gettysburg in July 1863. But despite this, the Union was war weary. And while it was clear that the South could not win on the battlefield alone, many Northerners were hoping for a negotiated settlement. An election loomed in November 1864, and it was by no means clear that Lincoln would be retained in office. Thus, for Whittier and Northerners who were dedicated to the unconditional defeat of the Confederacy, the story of Barbara Fritchie was quite a tonic. Prior to the publication of the poem, there wasn't much controversy about the story, and it was just one of many such tales to emerge from the war. But as soon as Whittier made the name immortal, complaints